We are certainly following the mood of moving from the business world, the government world, the educational world, back to the business world. And Mr. Liang, who's about to speak to us, is one of the great uh, entrepreneurs of our generation, having done many IPOs and brought businesses into being, given birth to them, but also a philanthropist who has actually created new ways of doing things as well as new businesses to do those things. So it would be a great pleasure to hear from you. Bill, thank you. So, I'd like you to listen to me in a certain way. I know you don't know me and it's a bit uh, presumptuous to ask you this, but I'd just like you to listen as if I was, what I'm about to say is true enough. Not the truth, but just true enough to perhaps be useful to you. What I'm going to talk to you about is entrepreneurship. And um, with a bit of luck, I'm going to show you a presentation on that and then we'll have a little bit of video entertainment at the end. Now, this is me. Um, the thing that I'm most interested in at the moment is saving the planet, and that's why I've founded WeForest.com. And uh, I in invite you to uh, go and have a play with what we've developed there. And entrepreneurship is something that's fascinating to me, and whenever I speak about something, I always look, like to look up the etymology of the word. And in this case, the word comes from a Frenchman, John Baptiste Say, and he invented the word when he was living in Croydon. So entrepreneurship actually has very special relevance to London, interestingly enough. Now, I used to do a lot of business in Germany, and I would often introduce myself proudly. I'd come and shake someone's hand and I'd say, Ich bin ein Unternehmer. And as soon as I'd finished that statement, that the person would sort of pull their hand back a little bit. And I didn't understand why until I realised that the translation Transliteration of Unternehmer in German, which means entrepreneur, also means undertaker. <laughs> now, um, when we look at actually the definition of entrepreneur today in the dictionary, I find a, things, a few things that I have a few problems with, particularly the third definition, because in my experience, it is impossible to start a business on your own. That just cannot work. There are people who have, I've met who have claimed to do it, but as soon as you dig in, you find that they needed other people to be, for instance, oh, I don't know, customers. Um, <laughs> the other thing that I've discovered is that there's a view about entrepreneurship. You see some of the, the uh, synonyms at the bottom of that page. And one of these synonyms is adventurer. And I see a lot of people are afraid of entrepreneurs. When I introduce myself as an entrepreneur, Somehow I'm treated like some sort of uh, flim-flam merchant or charlatan in some circles. And I, I think to myself, why is that? What, is, what, what makes people afraid of entrepreneurialism? It's less these days, but it still happens. So, what does entrepreneurship mean today? Well, some people would tell you that the, the start of modern-day entrepreneurship was, happened with this event which was when the very first venture capital company, ARDC, invested in the very first startup, which was DEC or Digital. And a former you know, dean of Harvard invests in a university professor who's working with transistors, and they get a 1,200 multiple on their investment. And this sparked an enormous uh, movement in the US. So a lot of people would tell you that that's what it means today, it's all about venture capital. And there's some evidence for that. If you look here, there's this little street in Silicon Valley called Sand Hill Road. And Sand Hill Road, every one of the names on this uh, list is actually the top venture capital and investment companies in the world. And together they have $150 billion under management. That's a big number. And they will all tell you that because they've clustered together and because they're in Silicon Valley, they've been able to create this great success because they have this theory that only one in ten entrepreneurs is going to succeed. And they've proven this theory. And so they say that entrepreneurs are scarce in the world. So one view of entrepreneurs in the world is that there aren't very many of them. That you must be, to be a successful entrepreneur, somehow super talented in some super way. And other people will tell you that value is, you know, it's all about taking risk. You know, entrepreneurs have to be able to take more risks. Or they'll tell you that they need to have scarcity. You know, they've got to find something that's so unique that no one else can do it. And which, to my mind, means that it would be impossible to make profit on bread, for instance. Um, 
But another one will tell you that greed is what's behind the entrepreneur. You know, some people say you know, you've got to have some sort of greed gene to be specifically good at being an entrepreneur. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about my own story. Um, I'm a three-time high school dropout, which means that at the time I was both persistent and thick. And um, I also share something great. I'm a quarter English, and of course that's where I got my crit cricketing skills. And, um, you know, occasional brilliance, I admit. <laughs> and I was already a husband and a father, and I was a wage slave. And something happened that changed my life. And that change, by the way, I was made in Taiwan. Um, you know, I was actually conceived there, so I'm half Chinese Australian. And that will be relevant in a minute. By the way, 42 years ago in Taiwan, the quality control issues were pretty bad, and you can see the result. Um, I got inspired by investing in other people. Now, when I grew up in the 70s, this was all I knew of Africa. The kind of, um, actually a friend of mine described it as uh, you know, crisis porn. These pictures of, of horrible things. And I'm a photographer too, and I can't even imagine how you even take this picture. Um, and, yet, and, and yet, this was the image. You know, everyone thought that Africans were helpless. Africa was helpless. Uh, these days I know a lot better. These days I know that, that actually charity and the whole system of charity actually creates some of the issues that, that we see in the Africas. Because there isn't Africa, there's Africas. It's like there's Asias, Africas, Europas, Americas. You know, we've got to stop these high level you know, uh, groups, by the way. So, here I had this idea of Africa and my wife at the time uh, of our greatest crisis, that is, you know, I've got $30,000 in debt, I'm in a dead-end job, our first child is on the way, and my wife goes to a place called The Hunger Project, a charity, and says, and she comes back and she says to me, honey, I've, been, I've pledged $5,000 to The Hunger Project because I think what they're doing is really good. And I want you to come and meet Lolita, who's the director of India, and I'd like you to meet her tomorrow. And I'm like, yeah, I want to meet her tomorrow for sure, because right? I'm like, no way am I going to pay this. And Lolita blew my mind. She <coughs> described what the Home Project does, which very simply is empowers women, primarily, and men, to solve their own problems. So my image of India at the start was this guy on the street, you know, who, of professionally deformed and begging. And my, Im my image of India after Lolita was this woman here who is leading a workshop voluntarily on entrepreneurialism. And this woman came from a village where she was, with, at the start of the program, uneven, unable to even say her name. She had been referred to as girl for eight years. And after this workshop and some inspiration. Here she is leading a workshop to 200 other women to get them to do the same thing. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is not charity as I know. No money was given to this person. I thought, that's fantastic. I want to get a piece of this. Okay, we'll commit to the 5,000. That'll be great. Unfortunately, the leader was a bit more tough than that. And she said to me, she had a fantastic deli accent. She dragged me aside and she said, Ben, 5,000 is not enough. You must give me your best money. I want, I know you're up to something more. You must pledge $50,000 to the Hunger Project. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> Very good. 5,000 was going to be a stretch. 50,000 to get it. And she asked me the question. She said, Bill, who would you have to become in order to be able to pay that money and not suffer? What would you have to change? How would you have to be in order to become the person who could make that pledge? And in that instant, I saw and imagined and was inspired to see a different future for myself. A future where I had become more successful than I had previously dreamed of. And I'm here to tell you that within a year I delivered 100,000 to the Hunger Project. And right now, my wife and I, and I underwrite two and a half epicenters for the Hunger Project, impacting nearly 50,000 people. And all of that success that came from Lolita's question, I've done seven IPOs, I've become a diplomat, 
Um, I'm now a micro angel. I actually invest in startups all around the world, young people, give them a tiny amount of money and say, right, let's go, let's inspire you, let's, let's start businesses. At the moment, I'm working with 15 different companies, all with young CEOs, one or two, I think, might even be the room. All of that success comes from that first question. How do I create a new future that I didn't imagine? And how can I contribute to someone else? Now, not bad for a high school dropout, but people have often said to me, isn't it being selfless? You know, isn't that artificial? Aren't, aren't your, your motivations somehow different? No, the fact is, there's no word for how I actually feel, so I've called it other more rather than selfless. See, entrepreneurship is a win-win-win game. It's not a win-lose. It's not about greed. If you're really good at it, it's win-win-win. So, what does entrepreneurship mean today for me? Well, I just want to take a little detour. This is where the people are in the world. And the big blocks are China, India, little little one over on the left is the US, but then you've got this huge disconnected amount, that's all the Africas and the South Americas. And when you look at where all the people are in the world, it's in stark contrast to where all the money is in the world. Right? You can see these rather overweight um, areas of the world where, where, where all the money is concentrated. And you can see these skinny places. And when you look at all of the value that there is and all the people there is, there's this huge disparity. There are so many people in places where there's so little stuff. And one of the things that I think uh, you know, shows that in sharp relief is that of the 2.2 billion children in the world, this is little children, one billion of them are in desperate poverty. And there's an even larger number than that that died in the last year that shouldn't have died. And by the way, there's a big difference between being poor and being in desperate poverty. The thing about being poor is you can actually be happy. If you're in def desperate poverty, there's no chance of happiness. Interestingly, it don't, doesn't take money to be happy. Um, if you look where the money isn't, one of the places where the money isn't is Costa Rica. But Costa Rica has, for the last three years, won the Happy Planet Index. They're the happiest country on Earth. Now, Bhutan is also right up there in the Happy Planet Index. Now, these are not countries that you typically hear of as world leaders, but in happiness, they're world leaders. So, there's some disparity here, you know, and it's the thing that drove us to those charity images of Africa, of the Africans before, the disparity that we have so much and they have so little, and the thing that solves this is actually entrepreneurship. <coughs> and the thing that sparks entrepreneurship is knowing something. You see, knowledge is fantastic stuff, and once you know something, if you want it, you can do it. I'll give you a fantastic example. Um, this guy is William Kamkwamba. Has anyone heard of William? This guy, fantastic. Watch his TED video. He was in, he's in a poor, poor, poor village in, in Africa, in one of the Africans in Malawi. And he read a book, he got a book. You know, you, you imagine that there's these books come to these, these African schools that are donated. And one of the books that ended up there is a book on wind turbines. And so this guy, as a kid, he says, I want electricity. So what did he do? He built his own. And it works. You know, if you could get the knowledge, there are people out there that can do it. Now, you just don't want to imagine the village that this guy comes from, right? It's just completely not the place for high-tech wind engineering. And here he is, he's built it, now he's building others and he's inspiring other people. This is entrepreneurship, solving the problem of poverty, solving a huge regional problem, solving a global problem, right? This is entrepreneurship leapfrogging our oil-based economy. Because once you know something, if you want it, you go get it.